Hello, my name is Maria Kondzielska and I'm your host for Pola Daily Culture. We are still celebrating 230 years from the moment of passing the Constitution of 3rd May. Here with us is Professor Richard Batterwick Pawlikowski, an expert in Polish Lithuanian history, and I would say also a fan of the end of the Stanisław August Poniatowski reign. Please tell us about, because in the previous episode we were talking about uh, the Constitution of 3rd May, how it was passed, and all the consequences, political consequences of this bill. But in what kind of shape was this Polish state before this bill? For most of the 18th century, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth remained in a state of deep crisis. It had just emerged from seven successive decades of warfare on its own soil since the deluge of the middle of the 17th century. And so its economy was ruined, it was depopulated, and its ruling nobility, its citizens, the Schlachter, had sort of gone into their shell. They were reluctant to think about change and they tried to cling to the certainties of the past in the hope that God would smile on them once more. And this in political terms continued for much of the 18th century. Particularly damaging was the liberum veto uh, and this is the conviction which at root is justifiable, but decisions are best made by consensus and by weighing up opinions rather than by simply counting votes. But it got out of hand. It got so legalistic uh, that by the end of the 17th century, it was possible even before a parliament had been legally constituted by the election of its marshal or speaker, for a single member to object to its continuing and therefore breaking everything up, make it impossible to pass any laws at all. By the middle of the 18th century, in the reign of Augustus III, uh, only one same passed any laws at all, and same after same was being broken up by the Liberum Veto very often before it was even legally constituted. So we have the paralysis of the legislative power. On the other hand, by the middle of the 18th century, an economic recovery is underway, and there is also signs of intellectual life particularly with the peerist father, Stanisław Konarski, who was a great reformer of education. But his greatest achievement uh, was the book Oskutecznym Rad Sposobie, on the means uh, to efficacious councils, which showed that the liberal veto was disastrous and that the best way forward was to introduce majority voting in the same. Did they manage to introduce the majority voting to the same? Well, the last time the Liberum Vetum was used was 1762. Uh, but nevertheless, it remained as part of the system until it was abolished by the Constitution of the 3rd of May in 1791. During the reign of Stanisław August Poniatowski, uh, there were restrictions passed. Certain categories of laws were deemed economic laws, and therefore they were... Uh, could be passed by various um, majorities, sometimes a qualified majority, sometimes uh, a simple majority. Uh, then there were matters of state uh, which had to be passed unanimously, and then there were even cardinal laws which couldn't be changed at all. Uh, and so we have uh, a problem in the reign of Poniatowski that the legislature is still being hampered. The way round it was the Confederacy. Uh, which is a kind of state of emergency or a league of citizens, so usually in order to defend the Commonwealth, its laws and its liberty from danger. And this was always formed, for example, during an interregnum. And this offered a way round the Liberum Veto, but only if the Russians agreed. In the reign of Augustus III, the Russians objected to any attempts to confederate the same. Under Stanisław August, the confederacies were such as that the Russians controlled them. And so nothing could happen that the Russians would not agree to. And so we get the subjection of the Commonwealth uh, in the 18th century ever more flagrantly, particularly from the 1760s onwards, to the will of the Empress of Russia. When we look at the situation, because um, 
the, this shadow of the, of the uh, Russian Empire was already so deep and so overwhelming the state. It, when we look from a perspective, was it really the best idea um, to bring that uh, form of democracy and invite the constitution at that moment? Or maybe better would be to st really strengthen the monarchy and uh, I would say get rid of the danger of, uh, of the um, states around, so for Prussia, Russia and Austrian Empire. The task facing the reformers was extraordinarily difficult. On the one hand, there was the international situation of the Commonwealth, surrounded by dangerous absolute monarchies of which Russia was by far the most powerful. So there had to be some kind of opportunity in which the necessary changes for the reform of the, constitu of the constitution and the institutions could take place. And this was provided by the war between Russia and Turkey or the Ottoman Empire and also with Sweden that began in 1787 and 1788. This was the window of opportunity. And then there was the task both of strengthening the institutions of government between Sejms and of strengthening the Sejm itself. The Sejm had to be able to function without going into some kind of emergency mode. And it had to be able to function for the future in a normal uh, fashion, but in partnership with a strengthened uh, executive. This was the vision of King Stanislav August, uh, but the circumstances were extremely unfavorable until 1788, when the Russians were engaged in a war with the Ottoman Empire and the same took the very risky decision against the king's advice to break with Russia uh, and to assert the Commonwealth's independence. It was risky because it should have been obvious that the Empress of Russia was going to take her revenge. In the end, unfortunately, they took it. But still, implementing the Constitution was a great, great achievement. And even though Stanislav August Poniatowski is judged by the historians, sometimes very roughly, it is still in his reign that such kind of achievement was passed and is remembered until today. And we can celebrate it. Thank you very much for watching. Pen and Daily Culture.